Welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us for Why Executive Development is Di Different Than Leadership Development, sponsored by Brainerd Strategy and presented by Michael Brainerd. Before we begin, I'd like to remind you that this webcast has been pre-approved for HRCI and SHRM credits. Please be sure to attend the complete webcast in order to receive your credits. If you have any questions today for our presenter or for HR.com, please type them into the questions tab on your GoToWebinar control panel and we'll be sure to follow up with you. And it's my pleasure now to turn you over to Michael Brainerd. Thank you very much, Sylvie. Thank you for all of you who have attended today. Uh, we intend today to share our point of view on why executive development is materially different than traditional leadership development. As a part of this conversation today, um, we'd like to offer some innovative techniques from two points of view. One point of view for you, the designer of the program, the leader of learning and OD or the leader of HR. And we'd like to consider some of the design considerations the second perspective that we'd like to talk about this topic from is the perspective of the developing executive. Um, and we'll talk throughout the program today from two points of view. Why is this different or what are the challenges from the executive learner perspective as well as the designer perspective? So my hope is that at the end of this presentation, everyone on this call gets an insight or at least one thing they can put into practice as they both assess executives for their needs and as they actually build programs. So that's what we're doing today. Um, why might we be qualified to talk about this topic is uh, perhaps I can talk about our firm and my own background. I'm an industrial and organizational psychologist by background. We founded Brainerd Strategy in 2007. Um, you should be chuckling even if you're on mute because the recession hit us like a ton of bricks in 2008 and 9, as most of you on this call know that investment in leadership development is considered or has been considered traditionally as a discretionary type of investment. Our firm started off with three service lines and we still hold those three service lines, although our primary focus over the last six or eight years has been executive development and leadership development. As a side note, um, we're based in Carlsbad, California. We have service offerings throughout the Western United States and frankly, throughout the United States. Um, and the bulk of our business is in both custom and pre-developed, uh, pre pre-developed, I should say, leadership and executive development programs. We've won a couple of awards for both our technology platform as well as our design. And I'll pretty much stop there in terms of uh, discussing who we are and what we bring to the table, but we'd be excited to talk with anyone after this call or in any way about how we may be a partner as we spend a lot of time both researching and practicing the topic of leadership and executive development. Why is this, why, let's start out by answering the question, how and why is executive development a little bit different than leadership development? You could argue that in leadership development, um, or management training, let's just go up the continuum. In management training, most of us would like an effective, efficient way to get skills into newly minted managers so that they can begin practicing management skills. Uh, management is a job duty. Management is not leadership. One gets promoted from an individual contributor to a supervisor, and all of a sudden they are accountable and responsible for coaching and development, bringing teams together, and driving performance through management. As we evolve in our careers, some of, some of us as managers and some managers have leadership capability that must be developed. Leadership develops along the lines of sort of business need and individual aspiration or achievement. When we have people that are interested in leading or show acumen, we want to develop those. We think about leadership development as driving self-awareness, having emotional intelligence, being able to create an environment where people can be productive rather than pushing people or overseeing or reporting or monitoring. 
I think the literature as well as practice has done a relatively poor job at then describing the difference between leadership development in the traditional sense and executive development. That problem's exacerbated because as you go around organizations, executives themselves often push back and resist development for reasons that we'll cover in a moment. One of the reasons that they may resist development is that it looks like the leadership development they had been through 5, 10, 15 years previous. So why we're here today is to talk about the transformative nature of executive development. The real difference in a, in a summary fashion, we'll explore this in more detail, is that executive development truly requires a transformation from true leadership development to enterprise leadership development or even industry leadership development. And these concepts aren't always made clear by the designers and or by the people driving the business. So we're gonna talk about the nuance and the innovation between leadership and executive development. Let's talk about executive resistance, which we all experience. I've bucketed those into why me, why and why now? One of the primary challenges we have in designing executive development program is what is an executive? Who is to be developed? Is it a director going to a VP? Is it all directors going to a VP? Is it just our high potential leaders? Is it our C-suite? And if not, why not? One of the things we ask as a fundamental question to our CHRO clients when they think about not investing in the VP and above level is who should be invested in and how. And then when we approach executives to understand their needs or their developmental opportunities, it's usually I don't have the time. Not me, it's for other people. Give it to my people, but not me. In a sense, executives are saying, I don't need to learn and grow anymore. I'm already here. And the reason I don't need to grow anymore is I've been through these programs before, they're all the same. And it's very difficult as designers and people who know that these executives need to further development, further grow and further be challenged. It's very difficult to break through some of these why me, why and why now. I'd like to pause for a moment because I'm trying to, I'm just trying to think about practical or applied things that I hear all the day all day, every day, all week, every week. What are some of the reasons why executive development isn't embraced by executives? Well, the first is I already know this stuff, I've been through it, or expert bias. The second is, oh no, not another program. I don't wanna sit in a room for, for an eight hour day when I'm as busy as I could be. How about third, less stated, but often very prevalent. I don't wanna be outed, certainly in a group, or even as working with a coach, as not being completely competent and having all the answers. And then four, None of us have the time. The time is, is the most precious commodity, right? I'd like to pause for a moment and invite you to engage in our poll. And I'd like you to vote. You can vote for one or two of these, but what are the things that you most hear around sort of resistance that come from potential executives to be developed? Is there one, two, three, or four that you hear that are most prevalent? And I'll pause for a second and invite you to respond to our poll. Some of you are already doing it. Is there one of these that you hear more frequently, one or two of these that you hear more frequently than others? Thank you for your replies. Maybe another 10 seconds to let people who haven't hit the button hit them or think of something else. For our broader audience out there, uh, time is our winner, right? Time is the commodity that can't be given back. And time and expert bias are the clear winners in this poll. And in fact, pragmatically speaking, as well as some like research that we've seen from Academy of Management would validate your findings, which is, I don't have the time and I already know this stuff. So 
if we believe that time and expert bias are primary pieces of resistance, let's pocket that for a moment and realize that as we build programs, we have to build in not only to the communication, but the actual design workarounds around time and expert bias. And very specifically, in a couple of minutes, or more than a couple of minutes, we're gonna get into how we design programs to bust through the resistance around time and expert bias. Thank you for participating. I'd like to move us to the, through this sort of evolution of design for a moment and leave the individual executive bias behind or the, expert, uh, the resistance, forgive me, that we hear from, from executives. My premise here is that unless we show executives something that is materially different than they've been through before, then we are not enabling ourselves to break through some of that expert bias. If you think about it from a macro perspective or a market perspective, executives are developed in three primary ways, putting executive coaching aside for a moment. Psychologically based programs like the Center for Creative Leadership exist throughout the market and are sold prevalently. Uh, academic based programs are probably the most popular choice. We've got a high potential director or VP, we send them to Kellogg because they don't have marketing expertise if in the case that they're a finance expert. Stanford and UC Berkeley and, and these academic programs, these weekend programs, executive MBAs, seminars, uh, the market is flooded with these and executives love them because they're outside of the building and it sort of can limit any exposure they would have by not being, a, not being an expert within their own conference room. And the third type of program that exists in the market are mainly these internally built programs or competency-based programs. Many HR executives believe that once they build a competency framework, then the learning can be built on top of that. While true, um, and certainly very healthy for management and leadership development, what we know is that executive skills often span beyond an organization's competency model, and highly effective executives exhibit behaviors that are sometimes beyond an individual company's competency model. The perspectives that we look at in addition to the psychologically based, academic based and competency framework, these sort of things that exist in the current state that are challenges from a design perspective is of course, we've already talked about executive resistance. We've also talked about the marketplace. The marketplace hasn't innovated in decades. The psychologically based programs, the academic based programs and the competency built programs have existed for decades. This idea of show me something new or I've been through that uh, hasn't occurred in the market. While we've evolved around performance appraisal, while we've evolved around HRIS systems, we've evolved around compensation, executive compensation, ev evolution around executive development has yet to occur in the external market in the way that we would hope it occur. Some of the online learning tools and new measurement techniques that exist are being applied but they're not being applied in a way that we pull executives into the program. Measurement as an example. I hear my clients constantly struggle with measurement and measuring value because when we're developing executives, often board members wanna see the needle move. There are ways to measure effectiveness of programs. They're multidimensional. And just because we as practitioners aren't incredibly facile with those, sometimes we shy away. I find that innovating in the market breaking down executive resistance and showing new ways to measure our differences in executive development than leadership development traditionally. As we get into design practices, this is a bit of an eye chart, but what I'd like you to all take home is that this chart is flipped. So when I was a graduate student and an early developing uh, practitioner and researcher, I was in a leadership development practice area at a large HR consulting firm. And we were taught a very traditional way to do design for leadership development. First, do the needs assessment. That yellow bar on the right was our first step. And then understand the context, the culture, the organizational performance. And then understand the focus, our strategy, our processes. And then identify defenses or resistors. 
and then create the goals of the program. And I find that for leadership development, that traditional design map works well. But as we at Brainerd have developed executive programs, one of the things that we get most frustrated with is the CHRO or head of LNOD sends us an email or a call, which we love, that says, I finally have budget. I've got a group of directors or VPs, let's get started. The frustrating part is that there's no urgency, there's no business need. It seems to be an HR driven process. Again, for leadership and management development, that's wonderful. We're showing that we're investing in our people and growing our culture. That doesn't spark urgency for executives. Let's walk backwards through the model and how we approach a custom executive development on our end. It's not a wild innovation, but it's materially different to come at it this way. What are the business goals? Growth in Asia. We could grow greater in Asia or more rapidly if we had le effective leaders in place in China. This is not theoretical. This is a large retail organization that said we actually have financial models that show revenue and EBIT growth with the right leaders in the right parts of the country doing the right things. Now we have a business goal around value growth that's driving the leadership development program. Now the CEO can say to the resistant directors and executives, if you want to be mobile in your career, if you want to get rounded experience, you must go through this development program. We can't have it every time, but as a design construct, we wanna start with the business outcomes. Then we wanna identify internal and external issues and challenges. And you can see them in the issues column. Finally, we want to understand the infrastructure, LMS, global, non-global. We mentioned retail earlier. The way we develop executives in the retail industry is dramatically different than the technology industry. This organizational or industry focus is a key design consideration. And then the people. What is the culture? What is the implication for talent management? Once the executive is developed or goes through the program, is that a binary thing? Or are they rated in some way? Rating scares people. How do we do ratings? How does it affect the nine box? How does the board get reported to? Because all 15 VPs who go through the program for a year have to have some outcome. Are they all equal? We have to spend a lot of time on the people issues, both followership as well as the treated group of executives. And then last are the leadership needs. Not to say they're last in terms of they're less important, but we do need to understand the specific needs of the treated population as we design the program. But if we work backwards rather than frontwards, we find that we get to a bit more of the urgency from the business perspective, which begins to erode the resistance of, I don't have the time and I already know this stuff. That's why we go back to front. And in the Q&A section, I usually get questions about this. It's quite simple to reverse the order, but it actually has a material difference in how you will design. I'll only show this slide as a backdrop. Many internally built programs, many academic programs, and many of the psychologically based programs are just that. They are those things. One of the things I've learned about executive development is that when we combine theories and approaches, we develop an integrated way of developing leaders. One of the things we show at Brainerd Strategy when we're talking to a client, we actually show a Venn diagram of the three bubbles moving around. And I'll invite our design team from a corporate client to talk about where do we need to be overweight? Where can we be underweight? And how do we think about designing elements of a psychologically based program, a competency based program, and an executive or business academic based program? And how do we weight these design characteristics as we go through the design process so that we make sure that we're developing properly these three muscles? I call these three muscles fundamental to any development. When we go through the design process with our clients, we're always thinking about three muscles to build. One, interpersonal leadership, things like self-awareness and emotional intelligence, our ability to 
drive uh, followership by being personally vulnerable and open and trustworthy. Number two, organizational leadership. Great, I can get things done, I'm emotionally intelligent, I'm self-aware, but how do I actually drive two things? And I'd love you to make a sub-note here. How do I drive productivity and engagement? Organizational leadership to me is as simple as a formula. EP equals E times P. Executive performance equals the product of engagement and productivity. Organizational leadership skills are things like understanding group dynamics and team behavior. How do you build a high performing team? Well, it turns out there's lots of research in group dynamics and team performance that we bring. How about coaching? Does an organization have a coaching model? Are executives trained to coach and mentor and develop others? How about the identification of talent and the uh, sort of ability to drive performance through goals and accountability? These are things we talk about in organizational leadership and muscles that must be built. Finally, industry leadership. Regardless of your competency model, regardless of the previous two muscles, how does one think about executive presence? strategic acumen? How does one get a greater appreciation and understand of markets and how markets and customers move? One of the things we do in our executive development programs in a lot of cases is we ask our executives or even uh, make them listen to analyst calls. How many of your executives spend a time in a month listening to the competitors analyst calls in the case that they're public? How many industry leaders get locked into their day-to-day -day work and don't go to conferences as simple as internal or adjacent conferences to their industry? So we talk about industry leadership skills as widening one's horizon. Executive development probably differs most fundamentally by having these types of muscles built. Leadership development programs in the traditional sense are much more focused on personal and organizational types of skills. Yet another difference. I am a, a person who scans the literature and hopes to be a valuable consulting partner for our corporate clients. And to be a consultant, I believe one owes it to your clients to be expert. This McKinsey and Agon Zender article that was published in 2011 struck me, and I've not seen much better since it. Sort of a bottoms up study of highly effective leaders. If you haven't seen this article, I invite you to take a look at it. We're not big on magazines and public literature around our shop, but we do scan the literature for what thoughtful sort of bottoms up research. And by bottoms up, I don't mean I'm an author, not to say there's anything wrong with a Tom Peters or those guys they are great, but they start with a premise and then talk about and build upon the premise. The reason this article was so important was McKinsey and Agon Zender got together and they assessed leadership effectiveness across a broad population of true executives. And when they did that, they allowed these results to come to the top. And they found that thought leadership, the ability to build organizations and talent, and the ability to lead in the market were core competencies of a high performing executive across industries. You can see the competencies on the right and I'll let you know that there were two that the article talks about that were more important than others. The customer impact or being able to understand markets, customers in, in the industry in an insightful way was a high, uh, sort of a, a high, higher order competency that effective executives possessed across industries. And the second was developing organizational capability, the ability to coach, build teams and sustain organizations when they're not even present. It sort of goes to Jim Collins' uh, good to great premise of level five leadership. We took a look at the marketplace around psychologically based, academic based, and competency based. We took a look at some of the points of resistance of typical executives. We took a look at the typical design process. And then we took a look at this article and we began to build our own program that we have white labeled and or left as a standalone branded executive development program. And we've been successful by combining these elements and putting them out there for 
organizations who frankly don't have the time or capacity to build custom programs. And when we build custom programs with our clients, we certainly want to keep these things in mind. This article, I hope you enjoy it as you look at it. It certainly changed the way we think about executive development as being different than traditional leadership development. This slide is a little bit busy, but it's absolutely fundamental. I call it holism applied. Holism is a fancy term for saying, let's look at every variable or node in a system in a holistic way. Let's not look at anyone as a standalone. And I certainly didn't uh, invent lettuce or I didn't invent plastic bags, but to be able to put the lettuce in the bag in a creative, unique way, meeting the needs of the executives inside a one organization or across multiple organizations is what we call lettuce in a bag. Executive development typically exists around offerings that you see on the right. How many times do we throw together a training program based on a competency profile and forget the assessment piece? Well, we happen to know that whether you're using an assessment center or assessments, we happen to know there, there are four core pillars to assess. 360 for a snapshot of leadership effectiveness, some form of personality or behavioral preference, usually in the form of a Hogan, a Harrison, a Myers-Briggs. Number three is emotional intelligence. The research is clear that emotional intelligence is correlated to executive performance. And then finally, maybe something around, I don't know, strengths, or uh, I like the strengths finder. I like something that says, regardless of my 360 where my gaps are, what am I really unique? How can I be uniquely strong and leverage? How about coaching? Well, that's pretty expensive. We can't afford coaching. There's innovative ways to minimize the time and investment, time investment and cost investment around coaching. As a part of our standalone program called Accelerate, coaching is delivered in a, in a somewhat flexible way where the learner engages in coaching as they want. Obviously creating peer networks, creating learning networks off of the instructor-led module, but online on private learning platforms, providing just-in-time materials and self-study, providing action learning projects where the developing leader is actually engaged, not in a case study, but actually a part of the business that needs a fresh set of eyes by combining high potential aspiring executives and allowing them to come out of their business to solve problems, um, oftentimes creates learning. We often don't learn or develop as executives by sitting in a conference room with all of our needs met and the coffee being warm and the bananas being fresh. Most of you on this call will acknowledge, like most of our executives, when you've grown most or developed in your career, it's been through discomfort, even pain or stress. So by putting people into team coaching environments where there's peer pressure, putting executives into action learning situations are actually solving a business problem with a facilitator sitting along the way over a period of one or three months and then actually presenting to a board or a C-suite findings. This creates accountability. This creates some sense of urgency. What I find that executives actually need and want is the sense of urgency. They don't want to develop for its own sake. They want to develop such that it has a business impact. They're growing their peer networks and they're being challenged in a way that doesn't out them with lower level people as not being all knowing. When we put these elements together, not all of them in all cases, but when we put these elements together, we then begin to build the executive development program in a specific way. The example there is teaching. One of the things that I know from my own athletic career is that when I was injured and I had to actually coach people on how to do what we were doing, it was very hard for me. But by teaching, I actually got better at doing the thing I was trying to do. Asking executives to go out and run a course on cognitive bias and how it affects decision making, or how did they get to this point in their career, what is executive presence, causes them to unpack it, have to get in touch with some things, and actually causes effects and development in people around them. Now, obviously, all of our executives aren't great facilitators or teachers, but that's a part of development is inviting them to actually be the expert where they're the expert. These are just some examples of how we think about putting a specific development program together. Forgive me.
let's look at this slide for a moment. Before we actually build the program and we thought about holism, a primary thing to do in executive development is to be able to explain to a board or a C-suite how this program will move the meter. I find that many of my HR colleagues and learning and OD people, they long for this, but they're still mystified and believe that the metrics are inherently fallible or flawed. Therefore, I shouldn't even present them. I'll say two things, one in the macro and one in the micro. When you look across the table at your CIO or your head of marketing, their asks for investment are far greater than ours in HR, and the ability to quantify the return, I believe, is far more difficult for them than for us. A CIO asks for $13 million for some piece of an ERP system to be implemented over two years. How does the business benefit in a specific measurable way? I love it. I chuckle sometimes because they'll say, well, it will reduce the ability for headcount once this technology is enabling what it's supposed to enable. We all know that's a fallacy and we laugh at it now because oftentimes for the next two years, we're going to hire increased headcount and increased consulting fees. And then when that two years is over and the technology is turned on, we don't let go of that headcount. We may let go of the consulting fees, but these kind of myths create insecurity for heads of HR and head of LNOD. I believe we walk in when we request budget for executive development, as long as we have the business goals identified first, some of the business issues and challenges and the needs of the executives, we understand resistance. The third thing we have to do is we have to be able to lay out the metrics. This is a traditional view of metrics from a Kirkpatrick standpoint, where we measure individual capability and organizational performance. And without reading the slides, the typical levels that you see here are was the room comfortable, level one? Did it impact me, level two? How do I feel about it? Level three, will I actually change my behavior because of it? And level four, does the organization's performance change because of it? What we've done is we've just asserted a slightly different version of this model on this slide to include some form of an ROI. So, one of the things we do when we put together an executive development program, whether it's our program that a client purchases or we design it, is we start to talk about metrics early in the design process. Things like, what sort of knowledge, skills, and aptitudes will be increased when this program is concluded? And how will we know? So here's an example. Before the program, we'll ask the uh, participant to rate themselves. We'll also ask the participants boss to rate them on the key leadership behaviors that we've designed in the program. As an example, one piece of the program is to develop these executives as coaches. Okay, what's that mean? How frequently and how effective does this executive give difficult feedback or performance feedback? The manager would rate that. The participant would rate that. At the end of the program, the same question would be asked to the manager and to the participant. How frequently and effective are you giving performance feedback? Now, you might argue that that's not 100% accurate because the supervisor is not watching the person all the time, but I would tell you there's no better measurement than the manager's observation and the self-observation. How about number three? Do we have a change management plan in place for a change that the executive is involved with? Yes or no? Is the change management plan effective or good? Now we know, are the behaviors on the job changing or not? How about the business impact? Has the ability for this executive to change and grow hit current, not new, current in place business metrics? Things like sales, things like turnover, things like uh, external measures around market penetration. We believe very firmly that if we're designing the executive development program with business goals in mind, then those business goals should be movable. The challenge there is local versus global. Does the executive have some form of impact on local results? In many cases at the director and VP level, the answer is yes. We just haven't done the hard work to figure out and draw the line between the executive development program and the proper business outcomes. Once we draw that line and get agreement from the stakeholders in the program, as well as the C-suite, 
then measuring that is not that difficult. And finally, we'll spend a moment on ROI. ROI is so funny. People say, well, if I spend $350,000 to spend my high potentials through a year-long program, how will I get my money back? Sort of a funny question. I think uh, there's defensive metrics there around retention and culture and engagement, and there's offensive metrics around business outcomes. But let's unpack this a little bit. The reason that ROI has been sort of spooky as our fifth rail here, in addition to Kirkpatrick's four levels, our fifth level of measurement, is because it's a basic eighth grade algebra problem. We spend $350,000 to spend, you know, to send 15 execs through a program, or we spend more actually, if we send them, send 15 execs to Stanford, whatever the number is. And then we say, well, how do we get that number back and when do we get it back? And the answer is, that's very difficult to quantify and we lose a little confidence when we try. The HR magazines give us pretty fancy formulas to do it and most people laugh at the formulas they know they don't work here's what I would suggest we do as a profession and I don't say this with a lot of humility I believe we need to get much more comfortable at taking a look at measuring what I call impact variables if we spend three hundred and fifty thousand dollars I would ask the c-suite not the participants what impact do you expect to have on time to produce on quality metrics in the business, cost metrics, revenue metrics, and how do you as a stakeholder in this program want to participate in helping us calculate the ROI? Because the problem with calculating ROI is the business has to agree on the impact the program will have. I'll give you an example that's a real example from a very large manufacturer in the industrial building products. When we asked the C-suite, what are the impact variables that you care about one came out that was surprising. The field hates corporate, and corporate can't get the field to like them. We want a mixed group of directors and VP from the field and corporate so that we can begin to break down relationship challenges. I didn't expect that as a variable that they were looking for in this program. Traditionally, we hear changes in 360 scores over time or changes in sales metrics or customer engagement metrics. So this was interesting. So working with the business, we build what we call the cohort effect. Does going through a program of 360 and emotional intelligence and strategic thinking and going through a program as we design it, did we design it to create a cohort effect? Did we create vulnerability, peer groups that reach between field and corporate? Did we specifically design in each instructor-led module, the coaching and the measurement, things that the business cared about, which was breaking down some of this sort of culture problem. So in this case, the CEO was less concerned about getting the $350,000 back, much more concerned about what he perceived as a major risk to the business and a challenge to full performance. I'll give a second example of an impact variable. We know that these directors and VPs that we're taking through a program several years ago, we know that they are largely managing salespeople in the field. What are they managing salespeople to? Traditional metrics. So when we built the executive development program, we also rolled out, this goes around business goals rather than just having budget. We also rolled out a new set of what were called six success behaviors for every sales rep. And instead of launching them to the sales rep, we launched it through the executive development program. What was interesting about the impact variable here is that these impact variables very much correlated with revenue. Time to respond to a customer was a measurement that already existed in this organization's culture. So as we did the executive development program and we got into the coaching part, we rolled out the six success behaviors where time to respond to a customer we knew correlated to store performance. So as, as we built our general coaching approach, we also baked in the six success behaviors. At the end of the executive development program, the CEO is very, easy, very, very easily able to see in a correlation how that one organizational behavior could impact revenue region by region and store by store. And then he asked us to reverse engineer the effectiveness of the executive based on their ability to get their salespeople to change their behavior. We actually ended up writing a white paper on this because it's a great example of how an impact variable can then be correlated 
with a true return on investment. We had executives who went through our program and were exposed to the coaching model as it related to the six behaviors, and we could measure revenue impact versus executive who had not gone through the program and had rolled out these six behaviors without the executive development program. Where we can attach growth, I'm sorry, business growth and business goals to the design, we can then measure the impact variables both to the executive behavior and the org performance. Then that green box, once we get the organizational impact variable, then we can run some very basic correlations to changes in the impact variable and changes to either revenue or cost or retention. But it's very difficult to measure ROI without getting tight agreement from the business on the impact variables. Then, and only then, can we say how do those impact the variables correlate with org performance. This may sound slightly complicated, it isn't. It, the key is getting agreement from the business what the impact variables that are most critical and most aligned to the executive development effort. The second step is easy. We have master's degree IO students who can run correlation models in an accurate way to say, did we move on the return metrics or did we not? This, by the way, is brain damage you would almost never go through in a leadership development program. This is, however, brain damage you would always want to go through in an executive development program. Before we get to questions, I'd just like to make a second comment or a set of summary comments, I would say. Executive development is very different than traditional leadership development for several reasons. The first reason is that executives have a much broader span of control and different set of resistance than traditional managers and directors. I don't have time. I don't want to be exposed as not all-knowing. I've already been there, done that. Because we all agree on this phone call and this webinar that these exist, we start our design with the resistant points. Secondly, leadership development usually starts with a needs analysis. Everyone on this call knows that, and I dare say that's the last step in designing an executive development process. Traditional competency models are incomplete. They're not bad, but they're incomplete. So Roman numeral number two, executive development works backwards from the business need or the business goal. Once we define the business need and business goal, then we go into the organizational issues and challenges, then we go into the specific needs of the cohort. Number three, holism. Executive development is not coaching. It's not sending a group of executives to Kellogg. It's not sending a group of executives through a psychological assessment process at CCL for a long weekend. It's got to have everything. And by everything, I don't mean it has to have all 10 things, but it has to have a blended approach to design where we take elements of psychologically based programs, competency based programs, and business acumen or academic programs and we find the right balance to blend into the design. Fourth, the metrics. Executives don't want to go through a program because it's an HR initiative. They don't want to go through a program because they're supposed to go through a program. They want to be able to see the impact in real dollars and real return. When dollars aren't possible, can we actually show them changes in behavior? or changes in org performance, those sort of Kirkpatrick metrics. And then finally, we need to gain confidence that just because it's not typical doesn't mean it's not hard, it's not easy to do. We must challenge ourselves to identify business impact, quantify business impact, and correlate impact with time and cost dollar, or the time and cost metrics because there's not only a hard cost for programs that whether you internally or externally deliver them, there's a time cost or a soft cost. With our Accelerate program, for example, we tell our clients in no uncertain terms, there are five or six days over the year they'll be occupied. There's probably another three to four days if they're working the program right, they're working in different iterations of their cohort group or working with their coach or going to some external part of the program. 
but the development of the executive is the highest order value a CHRO can bring to the organization. It breeds intimacy, it changes people's lives, and ultimately allows executives to transform to enterprise leaders. The executive who resists, resists that I'm already there, I don't have time, I've already been through this, I know this stuff, beware. Those are the executives who begin to calcify and replicate. One of the things that we spend a lot of time studying here at Brainerd Strategy are how cognitive biases impact executive decision making. And one of the things we know about biases is as we gain success and as we get a little more tenured or older in our career, learning new things is more difficult because we assume we already know and we assume we're, we're sort of already baked. When you have an organization full of executives who are replicating and relying on previous experiences or believe that they already know everything there is to know about a given industry, you should be fearful. And that fear and paranoia should drive you to push harder for key groups of executives to be linked to key business outcomes. And then ask the question, how will we de deliver on these outcomes if we're not learning and challenging and growing, et cetera? These are the four primary Roman numerals on why executive development is thought to be different than leadership development. And I hope that we covered resistance or perspectives from the executive. I hope we also covered perspectives from the designer or the maker of these programs, so to speak. So with that, I think I'll pause. We have questions that have come in throughout the program, and I'd like to maybe just spend 10 minutes going through some of the key questions and responding to them. And I think we can uh, do that now. One of the questions is, what have you seen as the greatest success rolling out a program in an, in an organization? Uh, thank you for the softball question. The greatest success we see in rolling out programs, if I had to be very pragmatic and non-academic, is CEO engagement. When the chief executive genuinely talks about the growth and development of his or her executives, then we find executives who know that there's an accountability there. They know that their boss is for real, so to speak, and if they go through the motions, they'll be the odd man out, not the cool kid. So just pragmatically speaking, when we as a CHRO or a head of LNOD can persuade the CEO, if they need persuading, to passionately endorse development of other executives, we get high success. Secondly, when we have preordained business metrics that we know we can affect by the design of the program, when the executives sitting in the room know that this stuff really matters, it, it changes the behavior. So these are things that we find that drive success. I think I see another question here is, what about my industry is different? You won't understand it. Our executives are different. Um, once we get past the snicker factor on that, um, we acknowledge that every industry does have its own language, does have its own rhythm, and does have nuanced difference, and it's not immaterial. Having said that, one of the pieces of executive development that's most pleasing for me is that highly effective executives in one company and one industry are typically highly effective across industries and companies. There are very specific differences, for example, between building products and technology or biotech. And those differences are usually in the language and the speed of cycles. As an example, in retail, there are cycles that are quarterly, the fall quarter. In technology, the cycles are even monthly. In biotech, sometimes, Drug development is a decade-long cycle. So cycles and speed, as well as language, have to be considered in the development process. Um, but learning the cycles and speed and the language isn't that difficult if we have a good, tight partnership with our internal designer. Whether we're launching our program or we're building a program, the key to our firm is that we're external, meaning we can't be internal. 
So having a good partnership between our internal designers and our team is critical so that we don't miss the nuance of the industry or the company. I think we have time for a couple of more. How would you, ad how would you adapt executive development for a small nonprofit of 80 employees? Well, we can get rid of the 80 employees and just say small company and or a nonprofit. You're right, it would be, have to be adapted and modified. In smaller organizations, I find that putting peer groups together um, sometimes lacks a little of the, um, you know, in smaller companies, you guys are bumping into each other every day in the hallway. So getting people to work together in small groups sort of sometimes lacks its, its pizzazz, where you have a very large organization, you have execs who don't know one another and would benefit from knowing one another. So that's kind of a difficult thing. What I find in smaller or nonprofit organizations is much more tailored and custom learning has to be considered. As a part of any process, if you look at holism, if you start with holism as an approach to design, you might be heavier on assessments and heavier on coaching in a smaller or nonprofit organization. Nonprofits and small companies, a little bit different in that perhaps people are more insular. You'll find that people in nonprofit love nonprofit. They're they're sort of personally or passionately committed, not to say people in corporations aren't, but it's much more of a purpose-driven uh, sort of play. So there are, again, nuanced differences that we care about. Most importantly, I would argue that coaching and more individual or tailored learning, um, get, uh, as an example, if we're working with a 150-person nonprofit, that's a dramatic difference from Intel, right? Intel builds executives in a certain way, um, and that's pretty good globally. As a matter of fact, that's a business advantage to build that globally. In a nonprofit, you certainly wouldn't take that approach. You'd have a much more custom or tailored approach to development based on the individual needs of the learner. Should executive presence be baked into executive development or leadership development programs? Yes and yes. Uh, executive presence is interesting, right? If you're cynical about it, it's used as a barrier for people of color and women, um, which is not to, meant to draw a laugh, but it is um, sort of very hard to define. You know when you see it, and it's, uh, it's hard to break down and coach and teach. We have a very firm point of view on executive presence, and I believe that having a presence comes from one own, one's self-awareness and one's emotional intelligence. Second Roman numeral, one's ability to come off as polished, whatever polished means. So when we develop ex executive presence, we don't invite anybody to adopt anyone else's style as best, but rather we start with one's self-awareness, one's emotional intelligence, and then we talk about how do you engage other humans, whether you're an introvert or an extrovert, whether you're short or tall, whether you're a woman or a man, there are ways to engender followership and communicate confidence. And the idea that one can find their own executive presence is very firm in our design, whether we're doing custom or whether we have our own program. It's one of those things in the top of that pyramid that are sort of ubiquitous. Um, I once worked with a raging introvert CEO, and the board was concerned that the introversion was harming the CEO's ability to be effective in sort of the all hand setting or out with customers. But yet, when we went and talked to employees and we talked to customers through the 360 process. We found that this person was warm and comforting and genuine, and people loved this person. When I presented back to the board, the board was a little bit put off because, in fact, they were wrong. This raging introversion that they were perceiving didn't mean the person was ineffective. And so when we asked this, this particular CEO, how do you get this kind of relationship equity when you're clearly, as you self-state, a raging introvert with an engineering background. And the guy leaned over to me and he said, one person at a time. And I'll never forget that in my career because you can't treat executive presence as this sort of charisma thing. You gotta treat it at an executive competency level. Self-awareness, emotional intelligence, and the key factors that drive influence or engagement, which by the way, are known factors. Do we have time for one more question? Specific question to healthcare came in 
And again, it's an industry that is different. Healthcare goes from the front end of hospitals and clinics to the back end of the developers of the diagnostic tools. So healthcare is a wide term. I presume that we mean healthcare, we mean the deliverers of healthcare. Again, um, to us, an industry nuance that is important, but not a deal breaker. Uh, working with MDs and nurses and highly technically competent people is not dissimilar to working with scientists or engineers. Um, it's not the same, don't hear that wrong. But the service linkage model developed in the 50s and 60s was developed in healthcare. And the service linkage model says, show me a happy patient and patient's family, and I'll show you a good outcome for health. And we know that what correlates to good patient and patient family outcomes are great interactions with the nursing staff and the MDs. The MDs and nurses in the traditional sense of thought, the delivery of the care is primary, but we know that having bedside manner, having the ability to large, lead large groups of nurses as an example is different and is nuanced. And certainly understanding those industry differences is not too different from understanding the technology differences. Um, particularly nurses are, are wired differently. And we know across all of our industries that salespeople are wired differently, engineers are wired a little differently, PhD scientists are wired a little differently, and nurses are wired a little differently. And the truth is that's okay, that people choose professions for good reasons. Our job as designers to understand those so that we are joining the system rather than resisting the system. We've delivered successfully in two or three large healthcare systems. Um, and I think just understanding the nuance of the language and the pace is the most important thing we can do. I believe it's time for us to wrap up this webinar. I hope that you will keep an eye out for our next webinar, which will be on how do we innovate in high performing teams. We've understood something about group dynamics and teams of leaders and teams in general. I'll be putting together a TED Talk next year. Hopefully you'll look out for that. We've got a lot of research and development going on around how, why are all teams not able to perform at a high level? And that'll be coming out at some point. What we talked about today was executive development. Our program is called Accelerate. I invite all of you to think about how do you engage executives differently than leaders? They are different. How do we do that in a thoughtful way is important. If you'd like to reach out for more information, you can reach out to BrainerdStrategy.com. We'd love to hear from you. Hopefully you were satisfied with this webinar. And with that, I'll say goodbye and thank you. Sylvie? Thank you. Yes, thank you very much, Michael Brainerd, um, for educating our audience today. We really appreciate your sharing your knowledge with us. Just a few reminders for our attendees. If you'd like to view this webcast again, the archive recording and slides will be available for up to seven days for our free members. And of course, if you have a recertification membership or HR Genius membership, you have unlimited access. All webcast credits are stored in your hr.com account under View My Credits. You will also receive an email from hr.com within one to two business days, look out for that, with your certification credit information. Your feedback is important to us, so please take a moment to fill out the exit survey that will appear on your screen once the webcast has ended. This concludes our webcast. Enjoy the rest of your day.